You're listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience, a podcast dedicated to helping executives train their sales and marketing teams to optimize growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's accelerate your growth in three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. I'm Carlos Noche, and I'm joined by my very talented podcast partner, Lisa Schneer. Say hi, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we're talking about how to build a revenue culture that scales. So many companies are trying to scale their businesses to the next chapter of growth. What might be some of the tactics, strategies that really provide um, a big difference in getting there? And to help us with that very important topic today, we have Elizabeth Patterson, partner in charge of global talent acquisition, and Kern Singh, partner in charge of revenue excellence from the Sapphire Portfolio Growth Team. Welcome, Elizabeth and Kern. Thank you so much for taking the time today, and welcome to the show. Delighted to be here. Thanks for having us. All right. Before we jump into the topic of the day, something to help our listeners get to know you a little bit better and get a little insight into you. What might be something that you're passionate about that those that only know you through work might be surprised to know? Who would like to go first? I could take a crack at it. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll start by saying, Carlos, I, uh, I'm, I, I probably overspeak way too much, and uh, I believe in bringing my full self to work, so all my work friends and colleagues know everything about me, but... <laughs> What I'm probably most passionate about right now, and it's a little bit uh, accidental, but now just beautiful is so during the pandemic, during those three years, I probably hit a record and had three children during that three year period. Um, Wow. (laughs) One was intentional. Don't, don't tell my kiddos when they grow up, hopefully they don't see this podcast. One was intentional. And then we had, we had surprise twins in the middle of the pandemic. Wow. And so, so, so really right now, what, what I'm passionate about is being a full on girl dad, cause they're all girls. Aww. And, uh, I always like to tell people it's easy to be a dad. It's hard to be a good dad. And I learned that the hard way. So it's, uh, you know, perfecting that craft right now is probably right at the top of my list, which Elizabeth knows very well. Cause I talk about them way too much and share way too many photos of the same, but that's awesome. Amazing. All right, Elizabeth. And even though I do know you for, uh, I won't say how many years, but tell us a little bit about yourself. What's, what's a little pa- thing you're passionate about these days? Okay. Well, um, probably less n- hidden um, and uh, or less known fact about me is that I love bees. Um, to me, um, beekeeping is, is a little bit dangerous. It's a little bit complicated. Uh, it's... Um, kind of meditative uh, as well. Um, you've got 40,000, you know, flying insects that are around you with stingers and you're in their house and you're trying to stay calm. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful hobby. Um, I'm very passionate about it um, and working to prevent the decline of our pollinators. So I spend uh, a bit of time every couple of weeks going into our three beehives and um, doing my part to prevent the decline of, of the pollinators. Amazing. Do you make your own honey? I don't make my own honey, <laughs> but my girls do. Yes. And uh, uh, if you work at Sapphire, uh, don't tell, but you're likely getting honey uh, this holiday season from my <laughs> bees. and. Uh, we had about six gallons of honey on my kitchen counter wow. recently. So, uh, yes, uh, we're Lisa. pretty prolific uh, hives here in uh, good old Saratoga, California. Okay. Lisa, you'll love this. Um, I joined Sapphire maybe four and a half months ago, and Elizabeth, uh, she's wonderful. Bless her heart, came in with a mason jar of honey for me. And oh uh, I mean, it wasn't even that it was maybe this big and you never realize how much honey that is and how much you use in a given day, because uh, I've had that puppy for about four and a half months, five months now. It's maybe a third of the way down. And so mm-hmm. I, I could probably live for, for a long time with it, but I'll take all the honey I can get. Yeah, that's so cool. I think that, uh, of course, like the the higher mission of of helping to restore our pollinators is great. But then you also could take all of these you know, honey. You can make uh, 
bee pollen, you could do wax candles, you could do, you know, like there's so much you can do with the byproduct of bees. It's really exciting. So that's a super cool hobby. Amazing. Yeah. And so as you had just mentioned, Curran, uh, you're fairly new to the team, whereas Elizabeth, I know you've been with Sapphire for longer. Um, but Curran, do you want to kick it off with a little bit of your story? Like how did you end up here, your career path, um, and what led you to Sapphire? Yeah, happy to. It, you know, it's great because I get I get a chance to sort of share my story now that I'm at Sapphire uh, a few times over, and it's it's very much full circle, which I enjoy. So, and I'll try to be brief. But uh, early days, you know, got out of college and had no idea what I wanted to do with myself. I always joke with people: my majors were English, economics, and psychology. So, three ways to not make money. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, you know, I got in the workplace and I, the only thing I knew is I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to do something special, build a product and sell it and that sort of thing. So I took whatever money I'd saved up uh, during the four, six years of working summer jobs, et cetera. I actually moved to India for about a year, year and a half and started a company, built a product, brought some engineers on board. It was a little bit cheaper to do it over there and built a social media platform for the youth around sports. And uh, made sense at that time. I think it was super compelling, built this beautiful product. And once I was done building it, I had no idea how to sell it. I just had this thing and didn't know how marketing worked, didn't know how sales worked, didn't know the next thing about the next thing and uh, floundered. And pretty much in the course of that year and a half, two years, spent all that money, tail between my legs, ended up back home. And uh, it just occurred to me that, boy, I need to figure out the next piece of this puzzle, which is, okay, you can build a great product, but if you don't know how to sell it, it's just a hobby, right? And so pivoted and went into tech and uh, started, you know, reaching out to operators, revenue leaders that I knew or had heard of and just cold calling them. And of course, got lucky and found myself early stages in a cybersecurity pre-IPO company and cybersecurity was super hot. This is back in the day of perpetual software. So it's a little while back, but it was still, it was a hot company and hyper growth and 70, 80, hundred percent year over year went through a public event. The company was called ArcSight and I got to see what it actually means to run a revenue engine and scale it. Got to do that from there probably two, three times over. So it was early days at a company called Cloudera. Uh, machine learning, data warehousing, where I was their first operations hire, go to market strategy hire, and took them from 40 to 300 million in a public event. Most recently at Procore, a vertical SaaS company, again, joined them at 200, went 600 plus in terms of revenue, and also navigated them through a public event. And I got to see sort of the part of the equation that I think was always missing, which is how do you actually take some product and, you know, scale it and drive revenue, drive value to your end customers. So I've done that a couple of times over, which was a, a, a fantastic experience. I fell in love with it. So I don't think I ever anticipated going back into entrepreneurship. I just wanted to continue to hone this craft. And uh, fortuitously for me, Sapphire, four and a half, five months ago now, shoulder tapped me and said, look, you've got incredible experience in scaling companies. You've done that consulting, in-seat operating. We'd love for you to you know, join us and do the same here for our 80 to 100 active portfolio companies and share, teach, train, and espouse to others uh, all the learnings you have. So so like I said, full circle, I went from entrepreneurship to venture capital and had some operating in the middle. And it's uh, it's been a heck of a journey. And boy, is it fun to, to help our portfolio companies. This, uh, I all of a sudden have 80 companies I get to impact, not just one. That's incredible. Yeah, that was that's one of my favorite parts about being able to work with multiple companies as a as a career is that you get to see all the different unique challenges that everybody has. Um, so that that sounds incredible. Thank you for sharing that with us, Karen. And Elizabeth, uh, tell us a little bit about your journey to Sapphire. And, and also, I'm curious about your passion around global talent acquisition, because it's a big part of our, our topic today and, and top of mind for so many people. Sure. So, uh, so I'm, I'm happy to share. I do want to start by saying I am all the better having Curran as a colleague. Uh, he's such a fun collaborator. Uh, so uh, before I got into venture, which has now been 10 years, it seems like just yesterday that I started, um, I actually had a background in go-to-market in uh, sales and, and in marketing, uh, both across the software and consumer and then also services sector. 
uh, my friend Carlos Noche and I uh, got our start together when we were practically teens. Uh, and um, I started in sales development, which uh, really I think is one of the best functions on the planet, um, doing outbound <laughs> calling for a no-name company, language. a 50-person company um, that's trying to establish category was very humbling. Um, I, I got my start at an early CRM company called Clarify, really incredible company. Um, we did not initially have a... Um, a revenue driven culture. We had an engineering driven culture. Um, we transformed and, and had a, a revenue driven culture uh, as we as we grew. But um, I moved from sales development into supervising sales dev reps. And then I was recruited into the field uh, into an enterprise AE role. Uh, when the company was, um, I think I started when we we're, you know, sub 75 people. And maybe when we were I don't know, 200 people-ish, 150 people, uh, I went out into the field. And uh, I was an AE on the West Coast initially, um, geographically based. Um, the company scaled. The company went through both an IPO and then later an acquisition. Uh, and I, I stayed with a company uh, post-acquisition uh, for a time. And then I left and I uh, joined another software company. It was an early SaaS company um, in the mobile resource management space called AtRoad. And I was recruited by um, a VP that had recruited me to the field at Clarify. And he recruited me to build SMB sales there and then also marketing programs. So I owned that. And um, that company exited as well. Um, and uh, and then I went to work in a different capacity for Nike. Um, Nike was uh, launching a new division called Nike Women, and um, it was a new category for them. This is um, pre Lululemon and pre Athleta, and they had both performance wear as well as um, uh, you know clothing that would. Um, you know, allow you to go from day into evening. And it was um, fantastic. Uh, great experience working for such an iconic marketer. And then following that, uh, I went to work for value selling and the team at Visualize. Um, value selling as a methodology changed my life in a lot of ways. And um, uh, had the privilege of working with that team for a number of years. Um, I've always been relationship oriented. I've always recruited and developed and led high performing teams. Uh, I still am in touch with people that I hired uh, 20 years ago and uh, still am a mentor to those people. Um, and I really thrive in these dynamic environments and love to kind of roll up my sleeves and have, um, uh, um, you know, significant um, valuation impacts. Uh, so a lot of people ask, how did I get from that into venture capital? Because it's not a linear uh, pathway. Um, I had um, uh, sold software to, well, first I'll, I'll take a step back. Um, in order to get into venture capital, either you have to have a lot of capital yourself, you have to have a very differentiated skill set i.e. you need to know natural language processing or AI, machine learning, um, you know, a differentiated skill set, or you need to have networks like no other. And in my case, it was the latter. Um, I had been called a human router. I had been called a center of gravity. And so I was recruited into a venture firm by um, a CEO that I knew from selling enterprise software, a gentleman named Brian Stolle from Agile Software. Um, Brian um, was someone that I had helped to find his chief customer officer when I was at Agile. It was a gentleman that I had sold software to when I was at Clarify. And um, I was always connecting him with incredible people. So after he sold Agile to Oracle, uh, he went to work for a venture firm called More Davidow Ventures. Um, More Davidow was an, um, a California-based, um, iconic at the time, venture capital firm that invested in companies like Coupa Software and VMware and uh, Synopsys, Proofpoint. They had almost 75 exits, but they didn't do a great job managing 
talent and you know they would they would close a deal and then they would kind of not know how to support those portfolio companies and um and that's how i got my start i was one of the first people who came into venture in a value added services role uh and i was called upon to um to be that center of gravity so anytime an executive talent was needed anytime a chairman of the board was needed an independent director a retained recruiter an executive coach an ip attorney um goodness um uh, really um any resource that a startup might need, a, you know, a realtor, somebody that would help them to expand internationally, they would come to me and I would save them time and money because I would know who the best and brightest was. Um, and I have almost a photographic memory for people and that helped as well. So I spent five years at MDV and its offshoot and, uh, and, and really building out knowledge in talent acquisition as well as in human capital. I was recruited to join Sapphire by um, a dear friend who became my boss, Rami Brunitsky, uh, to build their talent function. And uh, I, I joined Sapphire. Um, Sapphire is a growth expansion stage venture firm uh, with about 10.2 billion in assets under management. We have had uh, 75 exits since 2010, uh, mostly focused on um, that uh, a growth stage enterprise companies. So uh, companies that have between about five to 10 million in annualized revenue and product market fit when, when we invest. And, uh, and I was to come in and really help them uh, to build this talent organization initially. So working closely with our portfolio, mostly the CHROs and the CEOs and, and match executive talent and provide strategic human capital insights to help these companies thrive and grow and ultimately exit. Um, last year, so we are doing a, a, I would say a pretty solid job. We had 16 exits and eight IPOs, I think, and eight M&As. Um, and many of those companies were, were using talent that, that we had placed on our team within those companies. So anyway, it's like winning the job lottery, doing what I do every day. Hey, it is awesome what you do. And in fact, just as a little side note, uh, Elizabeth's superpower is her ability to connect folks, but she does it from a very genuine and authentic place, which I think mm -hmm. is hard to do. Um, I am, this is my 14th year doing what I do. And I owe it to Elizabeth because she's the one that lit the light bulb and said, hey, why don't you connect these two things together? Why don't you do this? And I'm like, huh? And hey, she was right. Here I am 14 years later. That's true. I never thought of that, but it is true. I did uh, suggest your current job to you. And I think that uh, um, you're thriving. So. Yes. Oh, that's amazing. I love that story, Elizabeth. That is fantastic. And it sounds like between the two of you, you're not busy at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we kick our feet up. No big deal. Yeah. Seriously, my goodness, the, some of those numbers and all of those things that you're doing, it sounds fantastic. And so to pivot over to a topic that's, I know, top of mind for a lot of our listeners is where do you recommend that most companies start? in the creation of this revenue culture. Uh, Elizabeth, I think you had shared a bit of a story around starting out as a very like a product led, engineering led culture and transitioning to that revenue culture at one of the companies you're with. How, uh, as you're working with your portfolio companies how, and you notice that same thing, how do they get started in that transition? Yeah, you know, if you're okay, Elizabeth, maybe I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll attack this first and I'd love to get your perspective as, uh, too. And it's funny you mentioned, you know, you've had an experience where you've had a engineering culture transition to a revenue one. I've seen the same. And I've seen both the good, bad, and ugly. I've seen an instance where, you know, I've had a leader come in and effectively just decree that, hey, we will be a revenue culture, right? That never goes over well. So it's not <laughs> one of those things you can just say. It's one of those things you have to have in your DNA. And if I kind of look back at, you know, past lives and what I've seen great companies do, the very first thing to articulate and to define a revenue culture is actually to define or sort of align the overall organization against a single mission, vision, purpose. Mm -hmm. And so the example I would give you is Procore was a great one where we 
started off being really clear about what our TAM, SAM, SOM is, right? What is our target addressable market versus what is it that we can actually obtain from a market standpoint? We became really intelligent and precise about what our ideal customer profile is, what personas we sell to, effectively saying, look, we know we can, most companies die of indigestion, not starvation, right? So we can only win if we have focus. So that means that, yes, we can sell to everybody in the world, but here is a subset we will sell to first, then second, then last. And here's how we'll do it over a five-year period. When you define that first and foremost, and you disseminate it across the entire organization, not just revenue, that's how everybody understands, oh, the North Star is, we're, we're solving the lives of, or improving the lives of people in construction, for example, for Procore, but we're doing it in this manner, and here's how we're sequencing it, and here's the value we provide, and here's what we re- achieve as a result, which is great revenue. When you kind of build that mentality, then that revenue culture becomes sort of inherent to everybody. And then from there, it's about really maintaining and managing it, which I'm sure, Elizabeth, you have lots of tactics around. I certainly do, too. But that would be my first sort of uh, go to, which is focusing on aligning the organization against that single mission and against that single target market. What what that is. So, Karen, once you have that organizational alignment, and I agree with you a thousand percent because I see organizations that don't have that foundation and they're trying to hit the gas pedal to drive revenue and the car ain't moving because <laughs> everybody you know, is not on the same page. So let's say once you have that alignment, how do you build a culture that truly scales? Yeah, uh, and Elizabeth, love for you to sort of chime in here as well. Sure. But I think, um, you know, from my standpoint, it's a lot about consistency around the messaging as well. And just making sure that you're really clear across the various layers of the business as to, you know, um, what we're trying to accomplish and what everybody's role and responsibility is in that exercise as well. But Elizabeth, please feel free to share. Uh, I mean, what's been your experience on the same? Well, one that, that um, I would touch on, of course, is, is really that, that team piece as well. So just ensuring that um, you have, you're, you're engaging leaders and the leaders are engaging cross-functionally. Um, you've, you've cast that clear vision um, so you know that you're working towards the same goal, right? Um, you continue to measure results as well, right? And, and I think that you're transparent in your communication, um, but you're also open to feedback. How, how can we get better? How can we be faster? How can we be stronger? And you're open to iterating through this process, right? Um, so you, you've started with this clear vision. Um, you've deployed great tools, um, but you're open to updating processes. And Kern's amazing at this, you know, from a revenue excellence perspective. Um, but you're open to updating processes to continue to drive operational excellence um, as you're scaling and and you're hiring and and we can talk more about this but you're being very very purposeful you're doing the upfront work to hire exceptional a players and and that takes more time but you're hiring exceptional talent and you're putting a premium on shared values um, so that uh, you know you're aligning with the, the the vision that you've set out initially, and you're not compromising on that. Yeah, do, and I'll, I, I'll actually add one more t- thing to that, yeah. Elizabeth. So I love how you went about this, which is like also be agile and iterative with it. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you a very clear example of what I think has worked in past lives. So once again, you know, you define your TAM, SAM, SOM. You've got everybody aligned against the same uh, organizational goal. Well, how does rubber hit the road? Like, what does that actually mean tangibly for an organization? Typically planning is a great way to go about it. So how do you set targets and quotas and to your point, Elizabeth, headcount, et cetera, so that you can actually sort of bridge the gap from this theoretical vision of what we're going to try to accomplish to the execution. The way that I make sure that everybody is sort of engaged, and that's what I think a revenue Mm -hmm. culture is, engagement from Mm -hmm. top to bottom is I make sure we co-create that plan. Yes. Right? And so, great, mm-hmm. we can prescribe a target, but I make sure that there's one or two months before the new fiscal year starts, for instance, where I have sellers sitting down and telling me what their execution plan is and sharing with us, hey, we know you want our ASPs to increase. We know you want our revenue target to be this year over year, et cetera. 
here's how I think we're going to do it. And here's how we as a company need to evolve the business in order to. So I call those productivity drivers. But making sure that everybody has a seat at the mm-hmm. table from top to bottom and has the ability or at least the space to articulate that plan partially because it allows for accountability, right? We can go back eight months later and say, hey, did you do the things you said you were going to go do? Are you feeding to the culture that we're trying to develop around accountability and execution? I would just say, make sure that there's space for that as well. And Elizabeth, to your point, as long as you can do that, one component of it absolutely is, how do you hire the right people to support that plan as well? And what are sort of the profiles you want to go after? If I can say one thing, and and I I do believe over the last three years during pandemic and then the um, more hybrid uh, um, remote work, it's it's in some ways been challenging, but it's also given us the ability to create a space for people to interact. And um, and there's so many great tools out there, um, you know. I mentioned a few, but there's Mural and, and, and Lucid, and there's the ability to have stand-ups using Zoom and have annual kickoffs, whether they're live or whether they're hybrid, um, have Slack channels, multiple Slack channels, internal, external, virtual one-on-ones, um, there's so many great engagement platforms um, that enable you to really bring everyone together and interface, um, you know, engineering can engage with sales, products can engage with sales, finance can engage with sales, sales can engage with engineering, you know, it, it, it allows everybody to come together. And um, I think there's, there's so much opportunity today uh, on a global scale to interact because there is new technology and tooling that is that's that's here for us. So I think we can all take advantage of that. Absolutely, I think um, more than ever we can connect across global time zones in in different ways. And the a few things that you you both said. So I think all of us have been a part of a startup that operated completely in silos, even though they deny it down to the ground. Wow, that happens a lot. <laughs> even with that, if, even back in the in-person office days, small startup, everybody's in the same office. I remember being on sales teams where we would actually like once a quarter demo our call deck to the engineers and to the product team so that they knew what they were building and how it affected our customers. So it wasn't just focusing on, I'm gonna make this menu two different colors for some reason, <laughs> you know, uh, which engineers can get caught up in. It was, this is the impact that this is having on the end of it. So a couple of things around, you were saying about A players. So how do we go about finding these people who aren't too precious about the process, can roll with the punches and also take that accountability that Karen was mentioning that we need them to have to really, push the, the vision of the company forward? What, how, how do we go about finding those people? Well, a, a, a few things. So um, one that I would say, and I just want to side note this, and then I'll talk a little bit more from a, a process perspective, but um, I do see in our portfolio and more broadly, um, oftentimes people are very rigid about the qualifications that they would like to have in a candidate. This person you know, must have PLG experience or this person um, must have been through a scaling journey from 25 million to 100 million and they must be from our specific domain. And it is, it's, um, it's so rigid, they don't always um, bet on the right people. And I think that um, oftentimes you can give people the opportunity to learn. Um, When you're so rigid, you might weed out great culture ads and uh, great potential. And, you know, I I list a couple fun examples. So um, back in the day, um, WhatsApp approached Facebook. Um, Brian Action approached Facebook in 2009 and, and, and he was rejected. Um, and then, you know, flash forward to, to 2014, WhatsApp was uh, acquired for almost $20 billion. And 
Um, you have, you know, other fun examples. I think Michael Jordan didn't make the varsity team. You know, he sat on the JV team and, you know, we know where, where he is today. So I think, you know, be a little bit flexible and allow for potential. I think grit matters a lot. And, um, you know, somebody that wants to learn and uh, has that potential. So um, that's something I'd say, um, take the time to hire those A players. Um, you know, an A player, and I've seen it, um, we had an exited company at, at our, um, both at Sapphire and at my last venture firm, um, the A players will attract other A players. A players can run circles around B and C players and um, just in terms of their productivity. So do take the time to do the upfront work and find these A players. Um, uh, and, and so how do you do that? One way um, we are quite purposeful, I think, about um, sourcing talent and, and building relationships. So you can create a scorecard that has a mission on it for um, the business issue that you are solving for. Um, it's more of a blueprint of the, the performance for the job. It can outline three to five quantitative outcomes that you want to achieve over the course of, uh, you know, six to 12 months. And, um, and the outcomes that need to be accomplished and then can also have competencies. And then you may say, hey, we'd like to find this candidate from the following universe. Um, in today's world, if you're not actively hiring, you can still build relationships with revenue leaders and build relationships with these passive candidates, um, reach out to them so that when the spigot turns back on, they know your company, your brand building, you've got rapport and you can move to these executives or AEs or marketers, customer success reps and hire these folks. So Elizabeth, Just, the, the one the one thing I would add, so I, I love how you approached it. Um, whenever I whenever I look to hire, whether it's in operations strategy or even sellers, and I do get to, you know, interview a fair bit of sellers along the way. I was told my leaders, make sure you understand the distinction between skills and competencies because they're different, mm -hmm. right? So skills are almost a little bit more on the technical side, right? Yeah, you can teach skills and actually the hallmark of a great leader is to train and develop as well, right? Mm -hmm. So you can teach somebody a new sales process. You can teach somebody how to forecast effectively. You can do that. Those are all skills that you can help develop. And if you over rotate on those, you might, to your point, Elizabeth, miss out on those diamonds. Yes. On the competency side, however, there's some elements that are a little bit more ephemeral that, you know, you do want to make sure you test for. Some people, I, I hate the term, but like executive presence is something that comes up. I don't actually care about executive presence, but I care about somebody who is relationship centric, for example, Elizabeth, like you, right, has a little bit of a better understanding of how to build vision and things to that effect. There's some things that are a little bit harder. It's kind of like the, I'll use a basketball terminology or adage as well. You can't teach height. It's harder to teach competencies than it is skill. So just make sure you understand what you're looking for when you go and hire as well. And I over rotate to competencies because I know that if I put the right program in place, especially with enablement, you can teach the skills along the way too. Very Great. good point. Very good point. Um, so I kind of want to circle back around to what you had said about engagement across global teams in this, like all the technology that enables this. How do you, or what are, and I'll throw this out to both of you, what are some best practices you've seen with teams that collaborate well, where that communication is open and they are trying to recreate maybe the spontaneous water cooler discussions that we just don't have today to help to get to know those other teams and really share value across the company. What are some best practices you've seen outside of the obvious like company stand up, but are there some other things you've seen work to really foster that? Yeah, I, I can maybe start and Elizabeth, you probably mm -hmm. have strong points of view on the same too, but I'll use my experience. So obviously during the pandemic, you know, so when I first joined Procore, it was 2000 odd individuals. We were in an office in Santa Barbara, looking off the cliffside, uh, off a beach. Um, so it was an incredible office culture. Everybody wanted to be in person, press the flesh, all those different things. Right. Um, 
pandemic hits and all of a sudden we're all sitting in our homes. I remember actually driving down to the airport to go to Santa Barbara from the Bay Area and midway through my Uber drive, I had to turn around because folks actually realized how difficult the pandemic was. And then all of a sudden it had been two years since I had. And so, yes, there's incredible tools like Zoom and others, right? That we've used Mural. I think you mentioned a few others, Elizabeth, that can help sort of bridge the gap. What I think I lost the most of, however, was those authentic relationships and those conversations, right? And so the main thing that I advocated for when we could over time is this notion of almost hybridizing how you think about that more sort of uh, that sort of a uh, new age workplace. So, yes, we can't be in person all the time, but especially in this day and age, right, I would find time to have quarterly, you know, off sites and things to that effect that made sure that we at least gave some space time. Now, I changed the composition of those off sites. It was less about the, hey, let's get all the tactics and work done. It was absolutely far more about team building and culture building. So that would be the one piece I'd definitely advise. And the second thing, which, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, I love coaches, right? So I've had a career coach. We actually, we had coaches in Procore days as well, Cloud Era days. But those coaches also helped us do team building and bonding exercises together virtually, which you'd be surprised how meaningful and important it is. It's important to know the Myers-Briggs Tenth score or whatever the the composition of the folks you work with now more than ever you need that information to be able to better interact so i mean overall i just say just be a very intentional about how you engage with the folks around you and how you compose the time that you spend in person versus uh, virtually and i think that makes a big difference I, I would share if you have the ability to do so and literally can go for you know a day, two days, a week, and, and really immerse yourself or do a job switch with another organization, it's amazing. Um, on the talent side, if you are representing, you're an HR business partner, or you're recruiting for sales, go spend time with that sales organization. Sit on the phones with them. Go on sales calls with them so that you understand your customer, so to speak. Um, you know, in a, in a remote environment, you may not have the ability, but if you can even shadow virtually, I think it's incredibly powerful. So you become more empathetic to to your peers, to those functions, and then you understand how to collaborate all the more. You're more effective in your in your day job. So if you can do that, I highly recommend it. I love that. I love that too, Elizabeth, because that was something when I was managing a remote team, I actually started managing a remote team before the pandemic. I had a team in Toronto entirely, and I was tasked with opening a second office here in Halifax. And so I was managing them while also running this operations kind of thing here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and something that I found helped a little bit was instead of always um, planning calls, like booking them in the calendar, mm -hmm. I would just call up one of my reps hey, how's your day going? <laughs> How are your calls going? Like, wh what happened today? Because I find, or I found back then that the the interruption piece, like it felt like they wouldn't have that spontaneous call because they were afraid they were interrupting me in a meeting or whatever, even though they had full visibility into my calendar. So I started just spontaneously calling people to try to recreate that feeling of, you know, you can call me and tell me how your day went, regardless of whether it was a mediocre day, a normal day, a bad day, you know. And then the other thing I love that you just said about shadowing. So I, when I first started out managing teams, I was managing an SDR team. And I felt like they didn't really know a whole lot about the business and how the business runs and what companies startups think about what are important. So each month um, I would have one team meeting that I would invite a leader from a different business unit to attend and to talk about what they do, what their business unit does, and then talk about how we can help each other be better. And so just a, a tip for any listeners who are also running teams, trying to build that kind of insight into what is each cog in this machine responsible for and how are we all connected um, so the shadowing thing i love that that advice too so pivoting a little bit because now we've talked about finding the eight players keeping them engaged how to drive and foster that collaboration how do we retain them mm. well i think that um Today, first of all, I think having a culture that is um, one of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is critical. Uh, I think it used to be a feel good. Now it's a must have. 
And, um, and so um, we at Sapphire actually have um, training. We have a partner called Paradigm that um, for the past probably five years has provided um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging training. Um, there's many courses that you can take. Um, for management as well as you know different levels of the organization, um, I think that learning and development is huge, um, and um, providing a pathway for growth for individuals uh, within an organization, um, making them feel um, secure. So, given the volatility that we have in the market as well as with covid um making people feel safe and secure is important um and part of that has to do with transparency you know across organizations uh across your company as a whole um and then i think um you know coming back to the office is something that um, employees are not going to prefer after they've had a hybrid work experience for three years. So really putting the employee first, being flexible, both in terms of allowing employees to work remotely, as well as being flexible in terms of the hours during the day that you can work. So instead of having a rigid policy of you must work you know, eight to five or nine to five every single day, giving some flexibility and saying, as long as you're getting your job done, uh, we're going to let you have flexibility. Go take your kids to work or, um, you know, go work out at lunch, whatever it is that that you may need to do. Well, Corinne, you want to jump in? Anything else you want to add? I mean, I think you you hit it right on the head. I mean, mainly for me, training and developing, right? That's a hallmark, like I said, of a great leader. I always used to tell my leaders as well is that our people stay for growth, right? But growth comes in a multitude of different ways. It's not just a monetary increase or a title increase. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's about just skill set increase. Did I get better or mm -hmm. opportunity? Did I get an opportunity in that bad to do something that I wouldn't have had the chance to do at another organization? By the way, you'll see more of this nowadays, right? You see a lot of companies trying to be more efficient with the resources they have. You're hearing hiring increases, this and the other. I mean, the flip side of it is that you'll have a lot of folks that will have the chance to take an app ad at a skill or an initiative or an endeavor that's actually going to help transform an organization that they wouldn't have had they, you know, been in a very large organization where there's tons of specialization and focus and all that. So I think just having awareness of, of all the different levers we have to retain our employees and using the right ones at the right time, I think is meaningful. Certainly, you know. Um, training and developing is at sort of the core of it in my mind. Karen, you, you, you might have just answered what my thought, my the next question was here, which is um, so security. We just talked about that a little bit earlier. And, you know, we, in fact, it was in one of our podcasts that someone came on and said it's one of those basic human needs. Human beings want to feel secure. And today, hey, uh, whether you call it economic times, everything going on, some clients are having to do something they haven't done in a while, which are do those layoffs, those rifts, and you know, and maybe more than once. So my question is, hey, not only are they having to do this, they're still expected to hit those growth targets. So how do we keep that revenue go growth kind of culture, even when we're faced, we're having to you know fine tune, reduce the overall staff and spend in an organization. Yeah, it's tricky, Carlos. Uh, you know, again, there's the optics of it certainly aren't ideal. I think I think there's some organizations that do that sort of org optimization, as I like to call it, more effectively than others, right? Um, we've come from a, uh, an environment of growth at all costs. What that actually means in my mind is, and I saw this as an operator, was that every year I'd have my planning cycle and my leaders would come in and say, hey, I need to grow by 100 sellers. Okay, that's not really tenable, but we still have to go do it because we need capacity and we need quota online, all that. So there was a lot of, I call fat in the system too, right? Yeah. We did a lot of sort of bubble gum and paper clips to, to grow the organization. 
So as, as organizations look ahead and efficient growth is the name of the game, then it is all about like how intelligently are you refining your organization? And some of it may be, again, cuts, but a lot of time it is reallocation of resources. Where do you put your energy and attention and how do you think about training and developing, like I said, the folks that you have in the organization the right way so that they have they can address the skills and needs of the business that are most prevalent now. I say that to say is that, look, if you are in an organization that is facing those headwinds, the the easy answer is, boy, the optics look bad and therefore I don't want to stay. But if you as a leader can articulate, one, the why behind it, because part of that efficiency growth is to support the rest of the organization, too, right, that, that persists and maintains. The second being being really mindful about, again, the opportunities that are arising now because there's a lot of work to be done in this new world order as well and giving folks that at bat. I mean, I think you give a chance for the folks that, that, that you want as high performers, you give them a chance to do something special within the organization. And that's what a lot of us want. We want to have an impact on an organization. Elizabeth, love your perspective. I mean, from a talent side, I have to imagine that you've seen the, the good, bad, and ugly here too. Yeah, certainly, you know, at this moment, we are being asked to do more with less across organizations. So part of it does come back with ensuring that you have um, those A players in place because those A players, I mean, there's a great study. I remember reading it and it's been a number of years, but HBR uh, put out a study and I think A players, uh, the productivity levels are so much higher than those B and C players. And at a time like this, you need them to carry you. Um, so just ensure that you have um, the, the right team in place that can, that can help carry you through. Um, I, I do think, um, you know, I have seen companies, um, and I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't um, reduce headcount at a time like this, but um, I think that people can be redeployed in different functions and um, it can mm. be very interesting. Um, you know, I remember a, a dear friend, um, Arnon Gashuri, uh, at one time was in a people leader role at Tesla. And I think he scaled Tesla from, you know, just a couple hundred people to maybe 46,000 during his time there as a people leader. And um, Elon Musk came in, they were having some challenges from a revenue perspective. And this is, you know, quite a few years ago, he deployed the human capital team um, and he made them sellers and account managers. Um, over a three month period. And, uh, you know, you had, um, let's say, talent acquisition went out and they called all the people that had canceled their contracts for, I don't know if it was uh, you know, Series S or Series X or what it was, but um, you had the human capital team doing something totally different and they did an exceptional job. So I think don't be afraid to redeploy people in interesting ways to get a job done at a time like this. Um, I think that um, we do need to do more with less. We are focused on driving operational efficiencies and yet increasing revenue. So it's a time to um, think creatively, leverage tools um, the right tools to ensure that your team can do as much as possible with fewer resources and um, also really hone in, um, sharpen your brand right now, um, whether that is uh, your, your overall brand um, as a, as a you know, revenue provider, your employee brand, and then also just sharpening your data too um, and, and looking at um, systems overall, um, again, kind of operational excellence right now. Those are things that we're doing so that when the spigot does turn back on, you are absolutely ready. Awesome. I kind of feel like we've kind of come, uh, it's almost like we come full, full circle. So whether it's good times or not, and you're trying to drive revenue, we got to start with a clear alignment of, you know, what do we sell to who and why they buy us? And then it kind of comes all the way back to then getting the right people with the right skills to support that. All right. I'd love to talk to you guys forever, but we, we got to close out or else I'll tell us my podcast is too long. Lisa, <laughs> Lisa you want to close this out? 
Yeah, I'll start. Um, so as you may have heard in our prep, we ask two questions at the end of every episode. And as you have both been in revenue executive positions or are currently, you get prospected to quite a lot, I would imagine. And I'm curious, what would actually stand out to you from a cold outreach perspective that might even in, inspire a, a response? Sorry. Uh, Karen, you want to start? Karen, you want to, do you want to take it to start, and then I'll, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll close Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll give two, just because one, I think you hear over and over again. Everybody says personalize those, those outreach is sure, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't do the basic level of research, it's going to be really hard to get my engagement. The other thing I would say is, me personally, I get a hundred of these every day, right? So succinct really matters. Do you actually know how to get right to the point effectively as well? So there's this balance, right? Personalize, but keep it succinct. I think is probably what works the best. If I'm reading a novel, I'm not, I'm not making it. I'm not making it again. <laughs> Makes sense. And for me, I would say if you can refer to somebody that we know in common, um, that's helpful. Um, so that's always great. And then I would also say, understand my business. Uh, so do your homework before you approach me and I'm much more apt to respond. Excellent. All right. Our last question, our little acceleration insights, and we have gotten a ton of insights from you folks on this call. So if you think about those young, maybe not so young sometimes companies out there that are trying to drive that revenue culture, what might be that? One little nugget of advice that you would give them that might help them achieve their goals. I can start. Uh, have a North Star metric. I think people discount this too much. There's usually 20, 30, 40 different metrics everybody's managing to. Have one North Star metric the entire company, not just revenue, the entire company can align around. Because it does, it makes sure that everybody's singing from the same hymnal. We know what red, yellow, green from a stoplight standpoint looks like. Um, so one North Star metric would be my advice. And that one's awesome. I even, I heard that on a call and I even hate to say it, but I asked someone that's outside of sales, what's your big metric? And he said, well, grow revenue, of course. And I said, okay, what's that number? She goes, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for that, Karen. Elizabeth, what's your one insight to close us out? Well, I, I would say, um, you know, if I look back at the companies that have been most successful that we have invested in, typically they are companies that knew they were going to build a product that was going to market. So they had a customer in mind when they built the product versus building something and then trying to decide what to do with the technology. So field of dreams doesn't always work that well. No, <laughs> not, not so well. Start with a customer and work backwards as you're building a company and a technology. So simple and yet such good advice. <laughs> Amazing. So thank you, Elizabeth and Curran, so much. If a listener was interested in getting in touch with you about the topics we talked about today, Sapphire, or hiring you as a speaker, what is the best way or your preferred way that they get in touch with you? Elizabeth, you want to take it? I mean, yeah, I would say um, you can either um, reach out to me on on LinkedIn. I think is great, or reach out to me on on Twitter. Twitter, I'm um, at Lizzie L I Z Z Y Pat P A T T, um, and on LinkedIn, uh, it's Elizabeth Arnstorf Patterson, and um, I, I'd love to connect. Same, same. LinkedIn is probably preferred. Uh, current saying, uh, again, uh, easiest way. And then we both do. We're not shy. We like to continue to share thought leadership. We're on podcasts, sharing blogs, uh, content collateral. So you'll see us out there too. Perfect. Amazing. Cannot thank you enough for taking the time. We know how valuable your time is and we really appreciate you spending some of it with us. And uh, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you again. It was Pleasure. a blast. We are so honored to be here. And um, thank you so much. 
All right, everyone, that does it for this episode. Please check us out at www.b2brevexec.com. Share the episode with your friends, your family, your kids, your dogs, get them off screens for a little while. And if you like what you hear, please throw us a five-star review on iTunes. I am Lisa Schneer, and I'm joined by my podcast partner, Carlos Noche. And until next time, we wish you nothing but the greatest success. You've been listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.